Okay, welcome everybody to Seder Night Studio. Welcome back. Um, today's today's shear is sponsored in honor of Leah Caroline's birthday in appreciation of myself and everyone at Hadram for their guidance this past year, making the study of Talmud much more accessible and also blessing all the women learning here today with abundant health, joy, and success in their Torah study. Thank you, Leah Caroline. Um, I want to now, on that note, I want to just mention that we're six weeks into the course already. We have four more sessions after tonight. Um, and I wanted to, we started, we made a survey. We'd like everybody who's joining the course, whether online or whether to, uh, on Zoom with us, we'd like you to fill out the, the evaluation already. A lot of people filled it in and it's great to get feedback. It's really important to us, especially because it's a Zoom class and everything is a little bit more distanced. It's nice to hear from people. And also it's an online course, so it's good to get feedback. So please fill it in. It should be a very quick survey. We made it as simple as possible um, and give us your feedback. Okay, today's topic, we're going to be learning, um, I will pull it up, we're going to be learning about Karpas, okay, even though it's not really about Karpas, it's a bit of a misnomer, um, as you will see. So we're going to start, I'll just review quickly, this is the page of the Gemara, just so you re remember how it, what it looks like. In the English, we put the first page on the left-hand side, even though really it's the reverse. So we're starting on Kuf Yud Dalid. Okay, we're skipping a bunch of pages. We're moving on to actually when we're at the Seder right now, the Mishnah is going to talk about what foods do we bring to the table. So we're going to start at the Mishnah. If you look here, I'll make it bigger on my screen. You can see the words Mem Taf Nun Yud in the middle of the Gemara. Again, this is a page of Gemara. The center is the Gemara. The commentaries are on the side. You can see the Rashi is at the top. The Rashbam is at the bottom. In most Gemaras, there is no Rashbam. It's kind of unique to Masech Pesachim. Um, Tosfot is on the other side. Rashi is always in the middle. And Tosfot is on the outside. Okay, it depends what your Gemara looks like. Um, you know, this is just a Xerox of it. You can't see it's not in a book right here. And then we're going to move on to the next page. Kufu Dalid Amud Bet. The pages are numbered. Amud Aleph, the first side, and the second side, Amud Bet. So we're going to read now. I'm going to move to the first sheet, and we're going to learn the Mishnah together. Um, okay. Heviu lifanav. Okay, there's something a little bit missing here in the Mishnah. It says, Heviu lifanav mitabel bechazeret. Okay, chazeret is usually that thing that nobody really knows what to do with on the Seder plate. Okay, chazeret is generally some sort of lettuce. And it says here, even though it's not exactly what it says here, I'll, I'll actually put it down so you can see the English also. They bring before him, and we're going to see, it seems like they bring before him something, okay, which maybe is the chazeret itself, maybe other vegetables. Now it doesn't, it sounds like it sounds like he's supposed to dip it into the chazeret, but that's not really what it means. It means they bring before him food, whether it's vegetables or other foods, and then one of them includes the chazeret, and he dips the chazeret, ad shemigela parperet hapat. Okay, parperet hapat I translated loosely as food that goes with bread. It means something eaten along with the bread. What it means here is what's going to be eaten with the bread later at the Seder, the maror. So it starts off, it's interesting the way they introduce karpas. First of all, the word karpas does not appear here. Okay, we, we know karpas from the beginning of the Seder. That's what we eat. We dip a vegetable in salt water generally. And it's not usually chazeret and it's not the same thing that we use for maror. But in this Mishnah, it's going to be the same vegetable that they use for maror. And that's going to be very key in our sugya. We'll get to that later today. So they bring the chazeret before him and he dips it. Ad shemigela prepared a pot, which means this it means until he reaches that part of the Seder, meaning this is not that part. This is something else. And later we're gonna to get to eating the bitter herbs with the maror with the bread. Even though it's funny, they call it bread, it's obviously matzah. Then it says, They bring before him matzah, chazeret. Now it seems we're getting chazeret for a different purpose at this point, haroset. Okay, which we're going to see, is that the same charoset as ours? That's a different sugi. I'm not sure we're going to get to that in this course. Ushnei tav shilim, and two cooked items for eating. This is for eating at the Seder. Meaning you need to have a minimum of two cooked items for your meal. Aval pi she'en charoset mitzvah. You should bring charoset, even though charoset isn't necessarily a mitzvah. Rabbi Leazar ben Sadok omer mitzvah. So we see there's a machlok, this is not our topic for today, whether charoset is a mitzvah or not. 
ובמקדש היו מביאים לפניו גופו של פסח. And when the Beit HaMikdash was around, at this point they would also bring the animal. Those learning Dap Yomi, we've been learning about that for a very long time. This is when they would bring the actual animal to the table and they would have it. Now, there's a few things to know about this Mishnah. So the first thing to discuss is what they're going to do with this Mishnah. And it's something a little bit strange because our topic today, if I had to, I called it Karpas, but it's really not. The topic today is, do mitzvot need intent or not? It's a very fascinating topic. It's a topic that comes up in a bunch of different sugyot in the Gemara. And it's a question, which is a really very basic question. Do you need to have intention when you're doing a mitzvah? Do you need, okay, now one question is going to be, what does it mean to have intention to do a mitzvah? And what does that have to do with our Mishnah? So the first line of the Mishnah is going to be Rich Lakish, looking at our Mishnah and saying, hey, when I read that Mishnah, this comes to me, I'm going to understand from here that we'll see whether or not he can infer from here whether mitzvot need intent or don't need intent. It's a little bit strange. It's like, I was thinking, uh, I tried to think of an example. So if I told you that I was having dairy for lunch on Shabbat, okay? Just happened to mention in conversation where I'm having dairy for lunch on Shabbat. Now one could listen to that and say, hey, I can infer from here that Michelle's family must be vegetarian because why else would they be having dairy for lunch on Shabbat? But on the other hand, it's very common where I live that people do actually have dairy for Shabbat, right? When I grew up, nobody did that, but here it's actually very common. And it's hot where I live and sometimes dairy is just lighter. And there could be many other reasons why I said I'm having dairy for Shabbat. Maybe I wanted to scare you away and I didn't want you to come for a meal. So there's all sorts of reasons why somebody might say that. So again, the Mishnah, the, they're gonna, what Rish Lakish is going to say is the fact that the Mishnah says these words, I'm going to assume something, okay, about mitzvot and needing intent. It's a little bit, I'll warn you, today's sugi last week was kind of simple because a lot of it was in Hebrew and it was kind of simple terms. It was bright out mostly. Today's going to be much more complicated, okay? I tried to simplify it in the Chavruta. I did some fill in the blanks to make it easier so you can follow where it's going. If you get stuck on a question, just move on. In some of the answers, some of the upcoming questions, I kind of gave you an explanation of what happened previously so that if you didn't get it exactly, you can move on. Um, and before we break for Chavruta, I just want to give, say a few basic things, which is number one. Ideally, if your Hebrew is reasonable, always try to do the Hebrew and only move to the translation when you need it. However, I would say that mostly if you're if you're kind of struggling, try to struggle through the Gemara parts. But when you get to the extra sources, like the advanced questions, don't worry there. You can really, if you don't have time, you can just read through the English. More important on the Gemara to focus on your Hebrew skills. Um, since there's fill in the blanks, you might want to use some Hebrew words today. If you do, you need to open, if you're using it on the PDF from the, with the designed copy, then you should open it in a, like Adobe reader or some sort of PDF reader so that you can write in Hebrew. Otherwise it'll be hard to write in Hebrew. And um, what else was there something else? Um, I think that's it. And okay. So the main thing you have to remember before you start Chavruta today is that in the, in the, Mishnah, there were two dippings of chazeret, okay, just to refresh it. So we saw chazeret was dipped in the first one, and then they brought chazeret to dip later for the maror, okay? I didn't specify this, but let me make it clear that the chazeret that they're bringing later was to be used for the maror, okay? So we have basically chazeret in the beginning for karpas and chazeret later on for maror, and that's where Rishakish Lakish is going to go off. The last thing I want to point out before you go to Chavruta is just about the class in general. Since we've already done six classes, I want to kind of take a perspective and just talk for briefly about the goals of the course and how I know we have a diverse group here of all different kinds of levels of Gemara skills. And I want to just remind everybody that even though this is a beginner's or, or not necessarily beginner's, but a skills class, you shouldn't feel that you have, you're going to walk out of the class gaining lots of skills because learning Gemara is something that takes many, many years and a long time. And the expectation of this is that we're just starting and we're getting started and we're going to give you tools and we're going to give you pointers. And over time, we'll have more courses like this and we'll help develop your skills. But there shouldn't be an expectation that after 10 classes, you know, oh, great, now we have all our skills and we can learn Gemara on our own. So I just want to calibrate expectations in terms of you feeling that if every class you feel like you came out 
gaining some new understanding of something you didn't know yesterday about the Gemara, then already that's a, that's a big accomplishment. So these are baby steps and we have a long way to go with our learning Gemara and I'll be here for the long term with you and we will progress over time. Okay.